We're going to go ahead and get started, so if you <clears throat> are going to be in here, please find a seat. As has been mentioned, Brian and Shan are already at the teen camp, and uh, they are taking our place, which I am glad that they're doing. Uh, we have been going to camp kind of as the mom and pop of the camp for 15 years, so I am uh, kind of enjoying the reprieve. Uh, but because of that, um, Brian, as mentioned, is out of town. Uh, I will be doing our first lesson on this book that we're asking everybody to read, and uh, I hope that we'll have some good discussion here today. Uh, I'm not interested in speaking all the time. I want us to talk and hear how things are going. So how many of you have had the opportunity to get the book? Okay. How many of you have had the opportunity to read the book? At least the first two chapters, okay. Uh, I think it's a very easy read, so um, uh, I also typed up uh, the lessons that I'm going to be doing today. It's already in the back. Uh, I have printed it up with, uh, with the notes that I have, and then I also printed up the study guide that is in the back of the book so that you can have it and write on it. And then. I also will talk about this in just a few seconds, but it has your neighborhood map on it. And uh, I know that all of our neighborhoods are different, but really do want this to be a, an incredibly faith-building time. Uh, also, too, uh, I think some of our parents, I know that uh, Josh and Amy are going to be taking Emily to camp. And so... Please be praying for Brian and Shan, pray for the families that are sending their kids to camp, and pray for the kids that are going to camp, that it'll be a great time. Pray for the counselors who are going to be in the, in the dorms and in the cabins with your, your kids. And uh, as I've said before, I feel like God does something in these teen camps that he does nowhere else. And uh, I am just fully believe in the power of our kids being together for a week and working through some things. So uh, let's, let's begin, if we can, with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, as we look at uh, this opportunity, take this opportunity to look into your word, but also to look into our own hearts, I pray that you would bless us and give us wisdom. Uh, about how we can be better Christians. Uh, Father, we pray that we'll be encouraged and uh, rethink what it means to love people and to love our neighbors. I pray in a very special way too on this day that you would bless uh, so many people that are going to be involved with our camp. I pray that you would uh, bless every person that's traveling there, that you would watch over them and give them just a great, great experience. Again, Father, thank you so much for Christ. We thank you for the way that he is uh, done so much in all of our lives, and we praise you for that. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. All right, so I'm not going to regurgitate what the book says, but I do want to highlight some of the concepts that are being brought forward. Uh, I think it's important for you to understand why we want to study this book. Uh, one of the things that uh, most of us have we've had the opportunity to read, you know, through the Old Testament and through the New Testament, when God, when God created you and I, he did not create you and I to be loners. He cre created us to be in community. And one of the things that happens because of our own sinful nature is that we will do things that will destroy community. And part of our becoming Christians is learning how to deal with who we are and what keeps us from building community and go back to trying to build community. Am I making sense here? And so 
we really do want to reevaluate what does it mean to love your neighbor? Uh, you know, the, we'll look in, in the great commandment in just a few seconds. But it's really important for us to just take time. Well, let, let's, let's go and start in Matthew 22. We'll look in verse 34. The Bible says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. And so as we're going through this book, as we're going through the, this, the art of neighboring, we're going to constantly go back and refer to just to those two commandments, love God and love your neighbor. Uh, I, I've laughingly said that when we get to heaven sometimes, sometimes, I hope all the time, all of us will get there. But when we get to heaven, I, I, I kind of feel like the Lord's going to look at us and go, why did you make it so complicated? I only gave you two commandments. But we get all worked up and make all these other things that have to happen. But in a very real sense, all, all that you and I need to be most concerned about is these two commandments where, you know, Jesus is telling this teacher of the law, he says, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so you and I on a day-to-day -day basis, if we're followers of Jesus, we ought to be thinking, how am I going to do it today? How am I going to love God the way that I need to love him? And he's asked me to love him. But then he says there's a second like it, and that is love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that all of us ought to be asking all the time, am I loving my neighbor as myself? Sometimes we will quickly go into asking God to help us and do things for us, but I do believe that in our walk with God, we ought to be asking at least two good questions every day, and that is, am I loving God the way that God wants me to love him? And secondly, am I loving my neighbor the way that God wants me to love him or her? Making sense? Now, I put down there, what does love your neighbor as yourself mean to you? That's a question for everybody. No answers. Joe. So Joe is sharing basically what we are going to be looking at, and that is being a neighbor is not just literally physically sitting next to a person, but it's really getting, learning to get involved in that person's life and doing things for them that you would want done to you. I mean, that's the qualifier in this love your neighbor as yourself, and that is that we would be actively involved in trying to care for the people around us so that we would we we'll love them the way that Jesus wants us to love them. Anybody else want to add to that? Chris? I think it's also important if we want to build a relationship that there's the reciprocity, there's allowing them to get to know us and serve our needs if they want to. So, sometimes we can hold them at work. You're right. Yeah. 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 And when we're trying to build a community where there's reciprocal relationships is not just us doing for our community, but we're trying to build something where we're pouring our, our hearts into people and we're giving people the opportunity to pour their hearts back into us. But it's really important that I, one of the things that I, I, I guess for me as I have been going and learning the, in this book is that I've often said my neighbor is everybody else, right? 
And so one of the things that I have done, which uh, I'm rethinking and hopefully can change, is that every neighborhood that I've ever lived in, I've gone and invited my, I've gone and introduced myself to people and I've talked to them about what's going on in my life and I try to find out what's going on in their life. But if they're not interested in spiritual things, I go on. I go to somewhere else. And so there are places where I've lived in neighborhoods, but I, after I've found out that they're not very interested in Christ, I just kind of go on to someone else. And in this, in this book, he's making us rethink that. That maybe what we need to do is think about investing in people around people around us so that we can build relationships that will eventually open up doors uh, and so for me that's what I'm learning as I think about this is that you know I'm supposed to love what Jesus is telling he says love your neighbor as yourself well my neighbors are not your neighbors y'all with me on this the people that live around me are my neighbors and I'm supposed to love them. And the people that are in your neighborhood are your neighbors and you're supposed to love them. And so you've got to figure out how to do that. Now we're going through this not to make people feel bad, but to get us just to raise up our sights and say, wow, I, maybe I haven't been as serious about building a community with my neighbors as I ought to be. And that's what I'm learning in my own life. I, well, let me ask you this, what has COVID done to your ability to love your neighbor? All right, I hear, I, I'm hearing mumblings, but I can't, I'm getting old and I can't hear. Susan. Oh, good. All right. Well, so Susan is saying in her neighborhood, the isolation has done something a little bit different in the sense that it has really gotten people out and looking out for each other, which is where we really want to end up in trying to build community. And so in that regard, it's a very good thing. How about some of the others? Yeah. Diane? Okay. And so for, you know, for most of us, which is probably where Diane is taking us, and that is that for most of us, we, we are trying to be cautious, but the reality is that it's done more isolation from other people than it has brought together. And now that things are changing, hopefully going back to some normalcy, we've got to lift up our eyes and start looking at the people around us and making investments in their lives. And that's where this whole, the art of neighboring is coming in. Uh, I saw a couple of other hands want to go on. Okay. Sarah?
Right. That's true. Uh, I was trying to go back, but you know, because of where Sarah lives, she lives on campus at Bellarmine, it, the COVID has exposed that there are needs that are there, and, but the reality is we make an assumption everybody's hurting, but we don't talk about it sometimes. Say, so how can I help you? Uh, I know that my neighbor, uh, my neighbor, not your neighbor, my neighbor works at the assembly plant and he has not been working. And so I went over to his house and asked him how he was doing, and he says, well, we're doing okay. I said, do you need anything? And he, I, he goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, I don't have a whole lot of money, but if you need something, I'm willing to share it with you. And he said, man, I really appreciate that, but we're, we're doing okay financially. And I said, well, man, and I just told him because I know that he attends a church, and I said, I just want you to know that I've been praying nearly every day for you, which I have been. And he goes, he goes, man, thanks. He says, I needed that. And he said, uh, he told me, he says, I don't know if you're aware of this, but we're expect, I knew that they were expecting their fourth child. Here they are in their 20s, laid off, and, you know, life can be very challenging. And he says, we just found out that our <laughs> expecting child has got Down syndrome. And he goes, would you please keep praying for us? And so, you know, that's one of those times where you have the opportunity to inject yourself into someone's life and hopefully to express care for them <clears throat> and that he's not just the guy that lives right, right next to me, but he's, he and his family are human beings who need the love of Jesus just like I do, you know. But we have got to really, I think, as we move forward in this, the, the end of this year and, and through the rest of our lives is we've got to continue to put into practice those two things that Jesus has asked us to. He says, these are the most important things. Love God and love your neighbor. I'd like to take a few seconds to go back and read the Good Samaritan in Luke 10. Let's, let's go there. One of the things that this book is going to try to get you and I to do, and that is, is to be <clears throat> actively involved in people's lives that live right around us. Uh, it is so amazing how you and I can <clears throat> pull into our house, open up our automatic garage door, shut the door, and then we're in our own little world and we know nothing about the people that live around us. And the goal is, if we're going to be supposed to love our neighbors, we've got to figure out how to do that. And it's to love them. And, and, and it doesn't say love them as long as they become Christians. Right? It doesn't say that. It says love your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't say love them if they are lovable. You know, kind of like the whole idea, love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you. You don't love them just because you get good, good feedback and good vibes. You and I, because we're agents, <clears throat> hopefully agents of change in this world, is that we will be the instigators of love in the lives of those around us. Am I making sense? Okay. If I'm not making sense, just nod your head or shake your head or don't do like that, okay? But to me, and this is where I'm at right now as a 66-year-old, is I want to continue to grow in my ability to love God, and I want to continue to grow in my ability to love my neighbors. I don't want to say, well, I've been there, done that. I want to be able to say, well, I want to learn how to do that even better. And that's what I'm hoping that we will all walk away with, is that we will ask ourselves on a continual basis, am I really loving my neighbor? Or am I just satisfied with what I've done in the past and I'm done? That's not where we want to be, right? Okay, all right. Luke 10. Let's read uh, this together. Another one of those guys asked Jesus. He says, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's a good question, isn't it? An important question. I hope that all of us are asking that question. And he goes, what is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Gave the right answer, right? 
Yeah. You, you and I can know the right answers and not do them, right? Yeah, okay. He says, you've answered correctly, Jesus replied, and look at this. He says, do this and you will live. He gets out of the theory part and says, do this and you will live. You know, some of us would say, thank you, Jesus. I'm going to go and try to do that. But look at what this guy did. He says, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? You know, no, and the thing that I hope that all of us are trying to evaluate as we think about loving our neighbors is that we are not going to try to find loopholes to get out of who, who is my neighbor. You know, I hope we're not saying, well, my neighbor literally is on my right and on my left, but that my neighbor is not the second house down, so I don't really need to worry about them. Y'all with me on this? And so we've got to be serious, I think. I think God's solution to a lot of our world problems today is if communities would really love each other, we would be able to help each other versus saying, well, we'll it, that's somebody else's problem, not mine. Okay? So he, the Bible goes on and says, he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan as he traveled, came where the man was. When he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, then put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expenses you may have. Verse 36. Question, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And we ought to go, duh. But the reality is, as you look at this passage, the priest saw the guy and did what? He stepped off to the side of the road and went around him. Could he have had a lot of reasons for not helping? Probably, he may have said, I'm exhausted from teaching everybody about God. Or it might be, I have my plate full right now. I can't add anything more to my plate. So he steps onto the other side, which is kind of like where my world is. You know, I, I, as a minister of this church, you know, I have close to 200 people that I'm deeply concerned about, and I want to be what I should be for each one of you. And then sometimes when more keeps added, added to my plate, I say, I can't handle it. And so I step to the other side, kind of. But then he, what happened to the Levite? The Levite is a committed Jew, but he does the exact same thing. These two guys are religious people. And if we don't watch it, we can fall into that same category of being religious people who are doing religious things and when it's all said and done, we don't have time to love our neighbor, which is what we always need to be brought back to. Am I making sense? Making sense. You know, in the book, he uses the idea, not a Samaritan, because a Samaritan to a Jew is, is a half-breed, and they were considered lower than dogs. And the point is, you guys are the Jews who are supposed to know the right thing to do, and here's this half-breed dog kind of like person, and he's doing the right thing, and you're not. In the book, he uses the idea of a, of a terrorist. He says, you know, you, us Christian people, we walk to the other side of the road. He says, and then a terrorist comes up, and he's doing what we should be doing. It makes me pause. It makes me think. And so in reality, as we go through life, I, I, I've had to really evaluate in my own heart, I don't want to be too busy or too about the whatever ministry business there is that I do not have time to love my neighbor. And in this case, his love went way past words of encouragement. It involved investment, money, all those kinds of things. 
Uh, but you, I hope as we go through this, one of the things that we will test our own hearts on is that we'll ask ourselves, do I at times try to justify the fact that I don't really want to love my neighbor? You know, we've all got reasons. The question is, what are those? You know, the thing that we've got to be serious about, and this is where we're kind of going with all of this, is we've got to be serious about loving the person next door. And, you know, most of us, as we go through life, we, we would probably say, <clears throat> you know, if I saw a wreck and I saw a person hurt on the side of the road, buddy, I'd pull over in a heartbeat and be right there for it. And I hope that that's true for all of us, right? But not many of us have gone through that. What we do have are hurting people who've been beat up by the world and beat up by Satan living right next to us. And oftentimes we will do nothing to help them get solutions to those problems. Am I making sense? Not trying to, make, not trying to guilt out, I'm just trying to say let's, let's raise up our eyes a little bit and let's see what we can do to love our neighbor, you know. Uh, they, uh, you know, one of the questions that I, I thought was important in verse 37, he says, the ex he says which, one of these, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robber? And the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And I was, thought it would be a, a, an interesting question to say, where does mercy tie in to loving your neighbor? You know, the way that I view it, and I hope that we would view it, is that God has shown much mercy to us, and we in turn want to be vehicles of mercy into the lives of other people. Making sense? Okay. Y'all getting so quiet on me, I'm getting worried here. All right. Well, I wanted to, I'm going to come back to something, but... I wanted to, in the worksheet, they have a question that I wanted us to evaluate. And that's that we wanted to read Acts 17, 26 through 27. And to be quite honest, this one is, it kind of took, took some of the visors off of my eyes. I'm going to read out of the old NIV. The new NIV doesn't say the same thing. Well, maybe I ought to read the new NIV. All right. Acts 17 and verse 26. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. And we would all go, amen. Well, look at what the old NIV says. It says, from one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he determined the time set for them in the exact places where they should live. God did this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us. So he set the exact places where you and I should live. And that, to me, was kind of like, whoa, I got to rethink that one. Because I've lived in places that I didn't think that was the exact place where God wanted me to live. Some of the places I've lived, I go, well, this is hell on earth, Lord, get me out of here, you know? But one of the questions that was asked in this guide is, what factors did you consider before choosing your current residence? And I said, availability or price or schools. 
And I wonder if not, part of our questions ought to be, Father, where are the neighbors that you want me to find? Am I making sense? But one of the things that is that they have asked us to do, and it's on the very back, I know that it's kind of a dorky looking map, I'm gonna just simply call, follow his, is that he says, if you're serious about loving your neighbor, then let's do something about it. And we all went, hey, amen, yeah, let's do something about it. And so his idea was, you know, the house to your right. Write the names of the people that live in that house. Better yet, not just their first name, but their last name. Write the kids' names that live in that house. <laughs> yeah, and Terry says, they have kids? Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know. I know one of my neighbors, my brother-in-law and, and his wife are moving next door, so I'm, I don't have to stretch to know that. And my mother-in-law will live there. So I've got a little bit of a cheat sheet over here. But my neighbor to my right is a young married couple, as I mentioned. They have four barking dogs. That's an obstacle for me. In my sinful nature, I want to offer them free antifreeze. But Jane says you can't be a Christian and do that. So, But I do know their names and I know the names of their kids. So I wrote that down. Across the street over on this side, I know the names of the people that live there. And... One of his occupations is a farmer. And I know across the street, we, we have this man, his name is Charles Williams. Charlie and his, his wife's name is Delilah. He says, call us Charles and die. Well, so that's an easy one. But he's known as the gatekeeper of our community. And I have loved him very much. He and his next door neighbor came over and snow, what is it, you blew, used a snow blower and cleared my driveway. And uh, I think I shared with that with you. I went and said, how much do I owe you guys? And he says, not a thing. He goes, that's what neighbors do. And so I wrote him a personal letter to thank each one of them in that regard. But I have right across the street from me, and this is where I'm feeling guilty as I'll get out, is right across the street from me is a new couple and their hours aren't quite like my hours. I've seen them, I've even waved at them, but I don't know their name. And so part of my homework this week is I'm gonna get out of my little world and go and introduce myself to them so that I can know who they are. But the idea with this map is take the time and write down, you know, right here I know that not everybody lives in a geometrically proportional neighborhood like this. But make your own map and come up with some ideas like the A is putting down their names. First and last name if you can do it. B is giving some pertinent information about the people that live in that household. And C, write down something that you learn having a face-to-face -face conversation with them. Because it's one thing to sit back from afar and wave your hand but it's another thing to have a conversation said, so this is what I learned because I went face to face with this person and talked to them. Am I making sense? Are y'all open to doing this? All right, I, I was talking, Sean Hall came up to me and he says, I wanna encourage you. And I said, dude, I don't need any encouragement. I said, I've got it all together. I said, no, that's not true. And he showed me his neighborhood map of how he wrote all those things out in his book. I thought, you go, guy. But the idea is that we really do want to build community where we live, and we want to make a difference. If you read the book, one of the things that was pretty convicting was that one of the 
they, this group of ministers invited the mayor into them and said, we want to make a difference in this city. What can we do? And the mayor looked at all the church leaders. He says, if you could at least build community where people care for each other, that would solve a lot of our problems. <clears throat> and I, was, I got convicted by that statement because the reality is we want the government to fix it. We want to tell somebody else that's their problem, not my problem. And yet we want to say, I love my neighbor. And what we want to do is get it out of that realm of theory and get it back to that's my neighbor, not your neighbor. I got to do something about that. Making sense? And that's where we really want to go with this is to build, uh, to really make an effort to uh, love, build the, be the art of neighboring and to build a community there. Um, at, at, at the very end of this uh, study guide on page two, it gave us a couple of action steps. And those were create your own block map and place it somewhere in your home where you will see it often. <clears throat> right? Okay. And then the second thing, and that's <clears throat> where my personal challenge is for this week, it says, learn the name of one of your unknown neighbors this week and fill in their squares on your block. Now, some of you have been living in your neighborhoods for years. You know, that may not be a challenge for you because you know everybody, but some of us have been living in our neighborhoods and we don't know anybody. I know, for example, Terry and Tanisha just moved last week into a new neighborhood, so they probably got a bunch of blank spaces. But it's the idea is that we want to be mission-minded in saying, I really do want to build community here. And I want to know them and care for them just as Jesus has cared for me. Am, am I making sense here? And so what I'm really hoping in the next few weeks as we go through this book is that you'll, you and I will just lift up our eyes and rethink how I can better love my neighbor. Because what's going to happen is as we get serious about loving our neighbors, we'll learn things about where people are, and hopefully we can help be, be the aroma of Christ to them. There may be some people that are really absolutely not interested. I can remember <clears throat> one time that Jane and I, we, were, we lived in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Jane went to meet this one lady, and she looked at Jane and she says, I don't mean to insult you, but I have enough friends. I went, snap. You know? That's kind of where the world is right now. But we want to be people that are agents of good and be the aroma of Christ to everybody. Amen? And then, so I'm going to close with that and uh, we'll I'll have a word of prayer. Next week, we will be talking about some of the obstacles of loving our neighbor. Uh, we will talk about, you know, sometimes all of us say our, our time is so used up, and then we will talk about the fear that keeps us from loving our neighbors. So, is this gonna be a good journey for you? Yeah. Okay, it's just to, not, not to guilt you out, it's to get you, let me rethink this stuff. Let me, let me engage in this. Because I believe that if we love people the way that the Lord would like for us to love them, there'll be doors that are opened up that we thought were closed. And who knows what God's gonna do, amen? Let's close with a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, thank you so much for this, uh, the beginning of this journey. Please help us to, uh, first of all, love you with everything we've got. It's so easy to forget how good you've been to us. It's so easy to just get into the business of just being busy and be, being busy, busy religiously. Please help us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And dear God, please, Please help us to lift up our eyes and to see our neighbors. Help us to love them the way that you have loved us. And please help us to build community. We really do want to make a difference in this world. Uh, bless us as we spend time in fellowship together. I pray that you would bless our Lord's Supper. Uh, we just want to be the people you are proud of. It's in Christ we pray. Amen. All right. You're dismissed. Thank you.
Yeah, we will start the devotional service right at right around 11. So you've got 15 minutes of fellowship and time to get together. And if you have children and kingdom kids, I know you're they would appreciate that. Right?